Hello and welcome to our seventh week of English 112. Uh, this week we'll be discussing drama as well as the uh, strengths and weaknesses of your papers. So let's start with the good when it comes to your papers. Uh, first thing I noticed is that we don't have to waste a lot of time talking about uh, grammar issues uh, or really anything to do with style. Most of you seem to have a pretty good grasp of it. There, On occasion there have been pro uh, some problems I've noticed. Uh, particularly with semicolon usage or run-ons or comma splices and things like that, but typically those types of things are normal. Um, just make sure you're reading my comments and learning what those problems are. Next in the good, uh, formatting is largely not an issue either. You guys seem to get the MLA format pretty good. Uh, citations for the most part are correct, things like that. Double spacing, uh, all the things that are expected of MLA format you are doing correctly, so good on you for that thing I'd like to mention, um, I mean, it's it's a good in a way, it's uh, it's hard to say, but it, nobody did terribly here. Uh, typically, at least one person has an abysmal grade on their paper. Uh, this was not the case. Everybody seemed to be, at least, even though they had problem areas, they still had strengths that helped to counterbalance uh, that grade and didn't make it so that, it, you know, not that failing this paper would be that detrimental, but it certainly helps that the grade wasn't awful in any case. Now that, of course, there's the problems with the papers. Uh, first thing I noticed, and this probably extends to almost everyone, or close to everyone, uh, is that introductions seem to be something that's difficult to grasp. When you're writing an introduction, think of it, you're introducing your subject, right? In the case of the poetry paper, you're introducing your poem and your poet that you're analyzing. When you write an introduction, you shouldn't be looking to, uh, and this is something that I think a lot of people think is a good way to start, is these vague generalities. When you talk about something that happened long ago, or you're talking about the point of poetry or something like that, it's not necessary in an introduction. Get to your subject as quickly as possible. Um, if you're writing, let's say, for example, about Lazy Lady Lazarus by Sylvia Plath, you're going to have to talk about uh, resurrection as a theme in the poem. And you could talk maybe a little bit about resurrection as a theme in general, and uh, how it's been portrayed in other works, or uh, just sort of our viewpoint on it, or your viewpoint on it, anecdotally, and segue from that, from a somewhat broader idea, but not super vague, uh, into your specific topic, which should lead, logically, to our next point, which is your thesis. When it came to thesis statements, uh, very few were able to do what a thesis statement should do. The first thing you have to recognize with a thesis statement is, you are arguing something. You have something to prove to your reader, right? And it's not something that is necessarily provable in the sense that we can debate it. It has to be debatable. You can't write a thesis that gravity or the speed of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. That is a fact. We can't debate it. There's no way we could really have an argument about it. But if you say something like uh, Lady Lazarus is about the theme of resurrection and how life is not worth living, then we're starting to get somewhere. This is the beginnings of an argument. And that's what you have to focus on. You need to give a idea interpretation of your work, uh, or the particular work, that's debatable. Right? When you do it with short fiction, we're doing the same thing. We're talking about a theme in a particular manner, all right? or a particular facet of that story. Of course, when it comes to thesis statements, you also have to recognize thesis statements don't just tell your reader what your argument is. That's the first half. What comes along with that is the explanation, the reasoning behind your idea. If you are going to say that the the poem has a specific theme, well, and that it uses that theme in a particular way, what are your reasons for believing that? What is your evidence, in other words? That's what's key. And by outlining your evidence, you're outlining the structure of your paper, the body. 
you're giving in order, in sequence, right, corresponding to those respective paragraphs, right? Reason one, reason two, reason three, reason four, however many reasons you end up giving should be found within that thesis and correspond to those body paragraphs that you are writing. This helps you keep in mind what the heck you're doing because that brings us to our next problem. Too often in these papers, I found that writers didn't seem to know why they were writing their body paragraphs. In some cases, the body paragraphs is meandered or they just sort of kept going for no apparent reason. They would offer points, claims, they would maybe give an argument on something, but then quickly move on to another. That should never be your aim. If you say metaphors are used in this poem in order to represent distance between the character or the, char or the speaker and subject, all right, that's a claim. Now back it up. Now backing it up doesn't just mean insert quote here and the point of your uh, paragraph is proven. No, absolutely not. You need to break down that statement, that quote, and unpack it, right? Look at that close reading example that's available to you. All of those things are interpretations, but there's reasonings behind them. Look at the, the poetry essay uh, that is a sample for you to read, right? It's taking time to break down lines and recognize what exactly they're saying. It may even be beneficial, not that you have to do this, Literally go word by word, decipher their meanings, right? Maybe that won't be entirely fruitful, but it's not fruitless. We've already sort of covered this, is, but every paragraph should aim to provide evidence and explain that evidence. I, I wrote about this in the academic form essay that you have available to you, but I'll sort of reiterate it here. Every good body paragraph, any time you're making an argument and you're sort of elaborating on one of those points to your argument, there's a process that's ongoing that continues until you find it sufficient uh, in terms of what you've provided to your reader. And it typically starts with a claim, right? We've sort of mentioned what a claim is. That's your sort of beginning of your body paragraph. It starts the thing off and it relates back to that original thesis, what it is you're intending to prove. So then you take that claim and you immediately provide evidence that supports that claim. But then you have to explain how that evidence supports the claim, right? And fits that mold. You're doing that constantly in every body paragraph. Sometimes you may have to do that process two, three times. Sometimes it's only once. It all depends on the point you're trying to prove. This is all very hypothetical, but you have to sort of recognize it in these terms. It's not cut and dry of when to do this and when to do that. It's very much instinctual uh, and learning what is the right thing to do at that moment. Said I'd like to move on to the topic of drama and specifically Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. So this week we're talking about drama and the elements of drama. What makes drama drama, essentially? Uh, of course, in our case, we are not reading any plays, we're watching plays, uh, essentially we're watching movies, but I think it's kind of strange to sort of require people to read plays than see them. It's not the same experience, um, and you have to really look at direction and things like that and staging and how that play is performed in that particular context. I think looking at a play in a vacuum isn't as helpful, uh, and it sort of diminishes some of the interesting things about drama. When we, we read a play, we don't have people, people performing things. It's almost like, a, we call this a closet drama, but it's almost like reading short fiction, just with the emphasis on dialogue. So we are going to watch a film version of Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. In, in a sense, with drama too, we have all those elements that we found in short fiction, right? We have character. We have drama. Or, of course we have drama. We have dialogue. We have setting. We have uh, symbolism. We have all those things that make short fiction short fiction. But in the case of drama, there are some differences that are worth pointing out. Uh, in, especially in the case of direction or even the reading of lines and things like that 
all sort of add to the way drama is perceived. It's not just what it is on the page, but in the interpretation of what is on the page. The text we're going to be discussing this week is Glenn Gary Glenn Ross by David Mamet, which is personally one of my favorite plays, which is why I assign it. Uh, of course, I don't just assign it because I like it, but also because I think it's a great drama, and it's probably something a little different than you're used to seeing. Uh, when we think of drama, we typically think of Shakespeare, who we'll also be reading as well, or George Bernard Shaw, or all of the in great English dramatists, right? Samuel Johnson and all those people. Uh, John Dryden, which are good, they're great, they're interesting to read, there's much to be learned from in them and, and gleaned as well, but it doesn't really adequately represent the world we live in. Uh, last I checked, I don't know too many people who are getting pushed into, uh, you know, arranged marriages and things like that, at least not in America and not in outside of Philadelphia. So it's kind of divorced from the world we live in, slightly, not entirely. And in the case of Gun Gary Glenn Ross, well, yeah, we all know what it's like to work a job that sucks, which is very much what Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is about. It's about this man, Shelley Levine, and sort of his dealings with the real estate company he works for and trying to, quote, be, uh, be a man in this world. And it's, again, it's something we can relate to. We know what it's like to not always be happy with our job or things like that and have those pressures on us in order to perform. I think it's also important to recognize, uh, with this play in particular, there are no women uh, in the film version or in the play at all. There's allusions to women. They are hinted at, They, but they're never seen. They're never given lines. Think about that. Why don't we see women in this play? Is this play particularly concerned with women? Or is it concerned with this masculine identity that these men are all trying to shape? And even the question you want to ask as well is, what exactly makes a man a man according to the play? You know, there's a lot of men in this play who are vying for control from one another. We have Moss, who's a bit of a... Uh, blowhard. He's always saying things, but doesn't, you know, and getting, trying to get people to do things for him, but he doesn't really do much himself. And then we have people like Ricky Roma, who is the ultimate uh, sort of bad boy, in, in a way, and the ultimate cool guy, um, who is played by Al Pacino wonderfully in the film, and his character is kind of slimy and underhanded, and but gets results. Right? And in the case of Shelley Levine, we have someone who is older, who is what we might call impotent in the sense that he's powerless, uh, and he really is has this sense of faded glory. Whether it is true or not, we don't know. Uh, and that's certainly something that's brought up and, and put into doubt. We have this very interesting cast of men, Aaron Al and, and Blake and Williamson, uh, all in the film version, that are vying for control from each other. We might call this Adlerian uh, a in terms of a power struggle, in terms of uh, relationships. So look at the masculinity and how it's represented in the film and try to come to some kind of conclusion of what it means to be a man. Another aspect worth mentioning, since this film slash play takes place, in a real estate office, there's a lot of emphasis on business, and this, uh, we could even say capitalism as well. We're seeing what, to an extent, this system creates, what it means to be a capitalist, what it means to be a business person. They're all vying to be the top of the leaderboard in order to win that Cadillac, Cadillac or to be number two and win the set, set of steak knives, or worst of all, being at the bottom two and getting fired, right? It's all perceived as a contest, but these are people's lives at stake, essentially, especially in the case of Levine, where we see Shelley trying to uh, win, basically keep his job in order to help his daughter in whatever way it is that she's in trouble. We're not entirely sure. We never get full disclosure of that problem, but we know something's wrong. And this is his attempt in order to make his way in the world. And it's all this capitalistic business type 
uh, con competition. But is that necessarily fair? I think it's one of the questions being asked of the play or by the play. Last thing I'd like to mention, uh, uh, just introduce a term that I think may be useful. Uh, you may want to look it up, but uh, consider it in terms, especially of this play. There is a feminist, uh, I think, feminist Freudian critic by the name of Eve Sedgwick. And she came up with this term cognitive mastery. And she says that in certain dramas, certain plays, and certain uh, films and fiction, there is a vying for control between men. They call, she calls it cognitive mastery. They're trying to outsmart each other, outwit each other, in order to be the man on top. So I want you to reflect on that idea and think about what that means in the context of the play in terms of this need for cognitive mastery, the dominance of one man over another, and also think about what, there, what are the ramifications? What does that mean about the society we live in, right? Because ultimately, the play is a reflection of the world we live in. It's trying to voice something, a concern or an, an outcry, or even, a, you know, I hesitate to say it, but an endorsement of that particular way of life, that cult, those cultural beliefs. What is this play trying to say about the way we treat each other and the world we live in? Consider those questions. Those are questions you should address and do your best to do so, providing evidence and explanation in the forums. With that said, that's it for this week. I will catch you next time. Peace.